I mean, the sense I got tonight with the, I thought was a great, the actual surround sound with the audience kind of behind, was the hysteria. And I think people forget just what Mark brought to British pop in 71 and 72. Well, that, that, that uh, hysteria was genuine. We didn't overdub mm. a thing. You know, this mm. was a totally live uh, recording, except for some backing vocals that we, uh, Mark felt we should have in the back there, because the rest of the band didn't sing. Mm. But anyway, that, that, the volume, that's probably what it was like in the room. You probably heard 80% screaming and 20% music. It's pretty accurate. Mm. Yeah. Well, people called it at the time t rex to see and, and Bolan mania and Rex mania. It was, did you perceive it yourself at the time as, as a kind of revived Beatle mania? Oh, definitely, and so did, so did Ringo. Mm. Uh, I was at some uh, launch uh, with uh, Paul McCartney, did an album around that time, and uh, the band played Get It On or something like that as I was speaking to Paul McCartney, and he said, how much did you pay them you know, to, to do that? But um, yeah, every, the Beatles were, I think this was the first group that really uh, rose to the height of the Beatles in this country, for sure. Mm. And um, I remember when I, I saw Mark sitting cross-legged uh, with Steve Peregrine Took mm. at Middle Earth uh, in Tottenham Court Road, I knew he was a star. Mm. And I knew this was going to happen. I just knew it. And I think he did too. I mean, Born to Boogie, the very title and the fact that he puts that picture of him at the start, like Eddie Cochran, a nine-year-old yeah. boy with a guitar, he, he felt that he was chosen and, and this was his kind of destiny. Yeah, that was his job description. He couldn't have done anything else in life but do that. Mm. He was made for that. He was born for that. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, it's odd because I first heard Tyrannosaurus Rex before T-Rex, actually, as a real nipper, and they were the most extraordinary, exotic, uncommercial band ever, in a yeah. way. The name, you couldn't even pronounce it on radio, Tyrannosaurus Rex, that's why the records didn't get played, as well as the most extreme voice you'd ever heard. You didn't know what he was singing about. So that transition, and yet you could see, could you see this? Could you see this happening? I think so. I, I you know, I'm not, that, I'm not a clairvoyant, <laughs> no. but I knew this boy was a star, you know. Yeah. And I saw the same thing in da David Bowie, by the way. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, like it's so surreal. I looked at this film tonight. It could have been like a, almost a Fellini film, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. That's what Ringo was going after for some shots, and Mark was too. And mm -hmm. uh, if you just turn the, the sound in this room, kind of added to the surrealness of, of that film. Mm -hmm. it was, in a way, it was like if it was like Brian Eno mixing on a bad day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, I like that. It kind of it kind of fits to this, but uh, mm. it's, uh, it does sound better. It really does. But so it, it was quite a uh, strange thing. And when he was in the folk duo phase, I know he loved the Incredible String Band. But whereas with the Incredible String Band from Scotland, you could hear every word meticulously pronounced and spoken, yeah. Mark was surreal even in his folk period. He, mm. I thought he was singing in French mm. when I met him. And, uh, but he, or, or, you know, Croatian or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And uh, so when I approached him after that set, when I saw him the first time, I went to Steve Peregrine Took, who definitely I knew spoke English. Mm. And uh, I, I, would, I didn't know where Mark was from or even if he was from the, the earth. You know, yeah. it, was that, it was that surreal. Yeah. Of course, Mark said that he sang that way. He was influenced by blues singers from the, um, mm. the 50s and playing their records at the wrong speed. Mm. So he would like play a, a, a 45 at 78, something yeah. like that. And he got the, huh. he actually sang along with the records at wrong, the wrong speed mm. and garbled the English very much so, you know, all yeah. on purpose. Yeah. Well, there was a couple of people who took that voice. Um, Mark always insisted that John Lennon did for Cold Turkey and that he was trying to get that Bolan sound. And even more so, the slap in the face was Ray Dorset from Mungo Jerry, yeah. who had that huge summer 70 hit. Yeah. Um, do you think that, that, and that was around the time that you recorded Rider White Swan as well, do you think that he could sense that his time would come, that he, he could actually, you know, and, and in fact there was a vacuum in the music in, in the yeah. centre of pop in 70, the Beatles are gone. What was really cool, it was good timing for us because all the groups went from uh, dressing well to dressing really badly. And, uh, you know, groups were started, like you see Ringo, they all, you know, you had to grow a beard. This is like what's going on over the world now, all these young, mm. handsome men with awful beards. Mm. And, uh, 
and, and to, oh, sorry, sir, sorry. And, uh, I saw a nice, handsome man with a beard there. Uh, he'll hate, he hates me, it's too late. But uh, then they, they made it worse by wearing the lumberjack shirts, you know, mm. like flannel shirts and all that. And people get up and, you know, stomp with their, their big Doc Martens and all that. And uh, Mark came along with the, you know, the prettiest face on earth. Mm. And even when he couldn't afford to wear his glam gear, just before that period, he would just put together things from a thrift shop that looked absolutely mm. beautiful. Mm. And uh, this is one way I realized that he was, he was Jewish, was I, I said, you know, that, 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 those clothes, that, that blouse, whatever you call it on you, looks fantastic. He goes, mm. oh, you mean this schmata? <laughs> yeah. so, so he could take a schmata Mm. and make it look like an elegant thing to wear. And uh, mm. so it was a great period to come in with this bouncy little song, Ride a White Swan, and have this beautiful man, and Mickey Finn was just absolutely handsome and beautiful and talented. Yeah. And we caught a period that was on its way out, and we were the new guys in town. We were the, the young Turks. Yeah, and also I think, the set, especially from this perspective now, when you think that Mark's audience really were the kind of people who later would listen to Take That or One Direction, I mean, the T-Rex sounded like the Velvet Underground, you know, compared with those kind of bands now. That was going out to five to 15, 18 year olds, that yeah. music. I mean, it's pretty wild. It, Mark's trick, he had a trick, uh, which I analyzed, and I worked with him so much, was that uh, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, people were still trying to copy the Beatles. Hmm. You know, if the Beatles used a French horn, you would use a tuba. You know, you would have to do yeah. something that was like the Beatles. You know, you'd have to one-up the Beatles. Mark skipped a generation. He skipped a decade. He went back to the 50s. Mm. He emulated, as clear as day, Elvis, Little Richard, mm. Chuck Berry, mm. Buddy Holly, you know, the same guitars. And, uh, yeah. and uh, that was his little trick. It was ingenious to go back to, you, you, like, in other words, the Beatles got so sophisticated, you couldn't take it any further. It was, mm. they did it. They mm. did the job well. And Mark just went backwards and took that era and started building that up slowly. Because mm. in our own way, with songs like Children of the Revolution, we got, you know, within that style of Marx, we got quite sophisticated eventually, you know. Yeah. So it's like building from the ground up from something so basic, yeah. the, the three or four or five chords that you used in rockabilly and early rock and roll, Mark made these incredible mini symphonies out mm. of those chord changes, and, and his melodies were, were just unparalleled. I mean, could Mark conceive the whole sound beforehand, or was it something that you both did mutually in the studio? With because the, there's that moment on Ride a White Swan where you hit a reverb button and he goes, "I want that sound." You obviously yeah. thought this is good, and then I want that sound. I mean, this is a key moment. In well, you know, what we did take from the Beatles is that uh, we were using flanging and phasing, all the things, all the tricks you could do with tape. There were no little bl black boxes yet, or stomp boxes that you know had uh, nine thousand computer chips in them. We, we had to do things like very, very organically, and I could do some of those things in my flat when I lived in Earl's Court. Mm. And we started experimenting way back then with, uh, mm. you know, just microphone placement and, and overdubs. Mm. What, what we did very well, Mark, Mark could double track and treble track very, very well. The vocals. He, he, the vocals, yeah. We were inspired by the Beach Boys. And you could hear on a lot of his uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex records, you know, we're doing a, like little homages to uh, pet sounds. Mm. And... Um, on unicorn. Uh, on, on unicorn especially. Mm. But yeah, we worked these things out first, usually at my flat. I remember um, Mark and June particularly came to my flat, not only for working out these uh, arrangements, but they didn't have a bathtub. So mm. that was their weekly bath, was it? <laughs> was in my flat in Earl's Court, and it was actually the bi-weekly bath. They went to mm. Mark's mom's for the, the <laughs> other, the other bath. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was great, great fertile times. And in the studio, we didn't do much on the sessions because we caught the band live and raw and fresh. Mm. And often, we'd get up to, say, take five or something like that, and Mark would say, that's it, we've got it. And Bill Legend would say, I've only just learned the song. <laughs> you know, mm. give me another chance, give me another take. And Mark would say, no, no, that's it. I'm, I'm going to just throw a few guitars on it. I'll, I'll mm. cover up those mistakes or something like that. So we were like, uh, I don't know, just pulling things out of the air very, very spontaneously. We didn't overwork things. We didn't overdo things. When it was finished, it was finished. And mm. it, it, uh, So a lot of the magic took place in the overdub stage with mm. Mark and his different guitar parts. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we bring in backing vocalists, Flo and Eddie, mm -hmm. and uh, later on, uh, Leslie Duncan, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I forget the re rest of the girls, but mm -hmm. I'll remember Vicky them Brown. after. Vicky Brown? Vicky Brown, and uh, the two sisters. From Sue and Sunny. Yes, yeah, Sue, Sue and Sunny. Sunny, thank you very much. Yeah, Mine. Sue and Sunny. Yeah. They would come in and, and do their overdubs, and of course, when uh, Flo and Eddie stopped uh, doing the high backing vocals, it was Mark and myself doing the high falsettos. So like yeah. Telegram Sam mm -hmm. is me like, you know, really squeezing the nuts together and getting out <laughs> the, the high notes. Even on there, wasn't it some vocal overdubs? Yeah, yeah, th that's Mark and myself yeah. doing some of those. Uh, and you mentioned the word spontaneity, and I mean, that film was not put together by focus groups like... Uh, oh, God, no. <laughs> it, was like, it was almost a, home, a concert movie. Here's how they were movie. editing the film. Yeah. yeah. It was completely <laughs> spontaneity. The other thing, um, in the beginning of the film, and also towards the end with the jams, there's that element... You mentioned about 50s rock and roll. Mark was a revivalist there. Yeah. He also wanted to be Jimi Hendrix, the other side of oh him, God. didn't he? Yeah. I mean, you can see that at the beginning, and uh, the jams. But did that really... I mean... It didn't quite work, did it? The well, no, he, he, something got into him when he did Get It On live. I, I, I saw one Get It On, I think, in uh, New York City at the uh, Fillmore East. He did that guitar solo for 20 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, th this is the real ab abbreviated version of that solo. This mm. is, uh, and it went on and on and on. Now, his Hendrix... Uh, his Hendrix uh, feelings, the, the, the aspirations. Mm. Um, he never quite got there, and I, I don't think anyone in the world ever emulated Hendrix, but mm. he certainly, Mark, idolized him. Mm. And um, But he was trying to reach out to a few markets at once, in a way. Yeah, you know, but the, the audience was clearly full of teenage girls who yeah. didn't give a flying uh, you know, F for Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. That was another audience mm. completely. And mm. uh, he needn't have done that, but you couldn't tell him that. You know? No. The other thing that I think people often forget now, or gets lost in rock history, is this, at the time of Mark's emergence in 71, yeah. this whole rock versus pop thing. And the, he, every week the, the letters page would be, Mark sells out, or someone sells out. And mm -hmm. it was rock and pop dividing, really. And he had gone from this under, complete cult, underground, you know, affixed to all the festivals, to someone who was bubblegum, basically. Yeah. Do you think, and he got a lot of uh, um, stick in the press for that, I mean, do you think he was hurt by that and perhaps that made him even more belligerent to go further into the pop market? Well, you know, I think the, the only mistake made was that, uh, that Mark made was that that audience, those girls and the few guys that adored him, grew older. Mm. And that's the way pop works. You know, their tastes, you know, just in a few short years, some of them were going over to the Bowie camp Mm -hmm. and other, other things, and you know, kids do grow up. And mm -hmm. Mark kind of was, his, his feeling I felt was crystallized in that film. Like this, he, he thought this was the way it was always gonna be. Mm -hmm. And um, whereas after that we made some fantastic records, like I loved Slider and Tanks mm -hmm. and all that. The audience, we clearly lost that audience. You know, some of them did not grow up. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's ironic that now in later years he's got a lot of teenage kids listen to his music now mm. and some of that audience never lost faith in him Absolutely. you know it's true but mm. the truth is that the, the the core audience kind of dwindled mm. and it did make him angry he couldn't figure it out i don't it really mm. frustrated him and also they got a lot of stick with the the fact that you've got this kind of formula that you'd worked out and i think in the early 70s that or 70 71 it wasn't see, that was seen as something from a, a bygone age, the, the Motown formula, the Spectre formula, yeah. the early Beatles formula, yeah. um, and got it in the neck. And people said at the time, this music's not going to last five minutes. Well, the irony is, all the knockers in those days, their music sounds so dusty. And T-Rex records, not necessarily live, but the studio productions, People, advertisers are still using them, and then they just I know. burst joyously out of the speakers. It, it's fantastic. They're full you know. of life in the 21st century, yeah. which is amazing. I wish Mark could have seen what, what happened to the music, because it, mm. it is fresh as the day it was made. I remember I remastered uh, Electric Warrior about, I don't know, five or six years ago mm. with a mastering engineer, and, and he, he said that. He said, this is fantastic music. It sounds like you just recorded it, like you're, mm. you're bringing me a new album. Mm. And you'll find that this, the T-Rex sound always, it re every couple of years, it comes back in new groups doing something mm. new with it. Mm. Um, Black Keys, for instance, yeah. did that. U2 did it about 10 years ago in Achtung Baby. There was like some 
definite T-Rex influences on yeah. that album, like yeah. overtly, overtly. Mm. And uh, it, 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 he did something, there's a spirit in his music that people still discover and find great merit in and, and, uh, and a platform to do something, put something of their own with it. Mm. So uh, it's, it's eternal. Mark projected himself as this huge star, and he's in virtually every frame of that film, apart from Cat Weasel and, uh, and Ringo for a bit. Um, but Well, he was the prettiest person in the film, why not? Yeah, <laughs> but at the same time, he, while projecting that very strong image, there was always a vulnerability to him. And I mean, that comes across there, I mean, I think Space Ball Ricochet, he puts his head back, and it's almost like... You can almost see him thinking, how much longer is this going to last? Or, I don't know, you were close to him for many years, you know, five, six, seven years then. And he also sounded vulnerable in the voice as well. Um, well, he had a soft side. You know, he was, <laughs> well, a lot of people don't see that, no, but, um, but I think fans get it. I think that's one of the reasons why there's that strong identification on top of the pops. He's almost like a Brian Jones character. He's almost looking out at the camera, looking at people. Well, someone like David and that, not, not necessarily, there was a, a real, almost an eye-to-eye -eye kind of thing. He yeah. has a, a real personal touch. It's quite hard to put it into words, but certain characters have that, and I think him being such a fan, of, he knows what it's like to be a fan. Yeah. And I think he knew how to give it out instinctively. Um, but there was a... So what's your point? He was well, the point was this... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, there's some... <laughs> He was vulnerable. He was vulnerable. <laughs> and, and, and you, and you, but, but people often see him as this completely, you know, in all the interviews, he got hammered for being this egotist who was, uh, you know, sold 100,000 records in three days and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, he was dancing really on fire. I think he was aware of that, wasn't he? I, I don't know why he was. He, you know, certain things he did I, fi I found very strange. I, I told you the story, like... At, uh, at the height of, of Hot Love, we were selling, we sold up to 60,000 in one day. Oh, record labels would die if they heard that today. You know, like they, they're lucky if they could sell 60,000 in three weeks. 60,000 in one day, and I, ring, I used to ring EMI every day and say, what did we do today? They went, 60,000. I go, fantastic. The phone would ring five minutes later, it would be Mark, goes, hey, Tone? I go, yeah. We sold 80,000 today. <laughs> Why he had to bump it up a few yeah. percentages, I have no idea. 60,000 is a big pat on the back, you know. Mm. Uh, but he was uh, insecure. No, I wouldn't say so much. Uh, you know, and he would put out such macho, you know, energy. And, uh, you know, he was not very, very tall. But, he, mm. you know, sometimes he would walk towards you and you go like, oh, you'd step out of the way, you know. Mm. And once he did actually kick me in the bollocks. Mm. <laughs> well, walking into the studio, I said, he says, uh, hey, how's your karate coming along? I said, fine. Boom! And he kicks me right in. Yeah. <laughs> and I, this is Mark. You know, he always had to front this insecurity. Like, he had to front mm. it. And, uh, I, it. But it was so obvious that he was insecure, you know. Mm. And when he was, when we had a moment together, when nobody else was in the room, we were together, he was very loving, very gentle, mm. and he'd speak about his insecurity. Mm. I, I introduced him to the Tibetan Lama that I, I studied uh, Buddhism with, that David Bowie introduced me to, and I took him to, to his house to meet him. Mm. And uh, Mark, you know, comes in with that jacket, mm. <laughs> those musical notes on it and all that, and uh, he sits down in front of uh, Chimmy, and Chimmy says, um, so tell me about yourself. And uh, Chimmy has a way of working some uh, voodoo. That All I heard was Mark say, well, I'm very young. And then the whole sound faded out, and Chimmy just put this kind of envelope around them. I couldn't mm. hear the conversation, but when I could see the, the facial expressions. Mark was not this. The chin mm. wasn't sticking out. It was very much mm. down. And he poured his heart out to Chimmy. And I'll never know what the actual contents of that conversation was, but I feel mm. that it was some kind of a time when um, he had permission to be himself, and he respected mm. Chimmy as a holy man. Mm. This is a Chimmy Rinpoche, very famous Lama who David Bowie studied Buddhism with, and I did as well. Because, I mean, it was obvious that Mark wanted fame. I think, secondly, he wanted recognition for 
is the purity of his art and yes. the fact that rather than just 40,000 Tyrannosaurus Rex fans, he wanted that a few was very million. Well, that was very important to him. He mm. wanted to make it with everyone, not just the fans. Mm. He wanted Ringo's uh, approval, mm. John Lennon's approval, mm. uh, David Bowie's approval, because, you know, like, I, I just do this teenage music, but I'm really a serious composer, which he was. Mm. There was a song, there, there Was a Time, at the mm. beginning of Roar Ramp. Mark was, you know, not that it's a slow, dreamy song, but he was a serious composer. Children of the Revolution, very mm. serious. But if you didn't say it, he would say it first. Mm. You know, he, that's the kind of person he was. Mm. But ultimately, I think he wanted, like most people, to be loved in a way. And I mean, how do you think he took it when, by the time Born to Boogie came out, you know, it, the luster was slightly going off. You know, it, it wasn't quite number ones anymore. I get the feeling that he would have been deeply hurt, really, by that. Could you sense that? No, well, he was covering it up good. I think um, he went through a period, probably he didn't notice it as much as you're saying. He was probably a little bit in denial, like, it's oh, it's mm. just a, a, a lull, you know, it's just a little dip in my career, you know, things will get better. Mm. I, and uh, he, always, he could always drive himself very hard, and... Uh, I think it's like like a boxer. If you get knocked down, you know, a good boxer gets right back up and keeps fighting. And I, mm. that's what Mark was. Mm. He would see that as just, oh, I was knocked down. That's all. I'm just going to get up and start punching again. He mm. he didn't like. I don't. He didn't suffer from any great depression that I know of. Mm. And why did you really part the ways with Mark? Because in your book you said he wasn't willing really. To progress much further, he always wanted to do one more album for the kids. That's right. That's his exact quote. Let, uh, when we did, um, what's the one after Tanks? Uh, Zinc per Alloy. Zinc Alloy. That was the one more for the kids. That I. Mm. It wasn't really. It wasn't anything. It was. It was like some great songs on it, but not the best T Rex album. And uh, mm. I don't like to, you know, like he's not here with us. But you know, he was kind of drinking, <laughs> drinking heavily, mm. and. Um, not that I was an angel, but, but in the studio, it was like it was getting ugly. Hmm. And uh, even uh, members of the band had uh, started to like not be at, at the sessions. You know, Bill, Bill Legend quit at the time and all that. Hmm. And I, I made one last plea with him. I said, like, why don't you take some time off? We had this, this uh, album called The Children of Ron yeah. in, on tape somewhere, which I, I had misplaced. I said, why don't you take a year off? You know, like... Pete Townsend did it. He, he wrote Tommy. I mm. said to him, why don't you take, we'll do this. And he could no, one more for the kids, which mm. wasn't helping him with the kids or anybody that last album. It was kind of not, not the best album. Mm. And uh, after a, a period of that and a couple of other issues I had with him about uh, payment, for instance, mm. he, he, tried to cut my, uh, he tried to cut me out of a royalty all of a sudden after mm. started. I was with him from day one, and here we are the end of Tanks, and, or the end of uh, Electric Warrior, rather. Mm. And all that, things were just souring. And mm. it was just not the best conditions to work under when my, you know, one of my best friends was treating me like that, and other members of his band. So we called it quits. You Do know. you feel that he undersold his potential, that fame made him close up in a way? Because, I mean, The Children of Ram was a vast project that he'd been yeah. talking about for a while. I mean, did he have that in him? Well, you see, you just said he was in every frame of the film. Mm. He could not bear to be out of the frame. Mm. He had to, like, the reason why he made uh, Zinc Alloy is, like, he just had to keep it going. He had to keep mm. the fame machine going. Mm. And um, he wouldn't, to, to take a year off, uh, he looked at me actually like, are you crazy? You know, I have mm. to make another single. Mm. I have to make, a, even though, like, the last single we made together, Truck On, Tyke was like, I don't think it even made the top 30, you know, and uh, maybe I think it did, but it, did. Uh, but it wasn't. It stayed there for a day or something, yeah, like a week or something like that. No, it, yeah. it's sad, you know, and he, he couldn't accept that. He just thought he'd have to make a better single, you know, and one mm. more single. And one. But, the, you know, these things have a, a peak and they have a trough, you know, they, they mm. just do. It's life. life. Life is like that. He mm. could not accept that. Because he used to always talk about wanting to be a full time writer and a full time poet, and he bought that. House in uh, near Hay on Wye. Yeah. Um, you know the the scenes here are kind of rustic. There was always that sense that he loved the countryside. He was a creature of the flora and the fauna. You know, Tyrannosaurus yeah. Rex. There was still that element 
of him, this old-fashioned romantic. Well, no doubt he was a poet. He put out that lovely book, The War Warlock of Love. Mm. And uh, did he put out a second one? I don't, can't remember. No, but I think posthumously stuff has been... Yeah, he was a great poet mm. and a great lyricist. I mean, you talk about surrealism, like uh, get it on, bang a gong, and the, the mm. diamond studded, crudded... <laughs> Silver hubcap, you know, yeah. all, that, all this stuff about cars and being so poetic with it. It, mm. it, was, it was just absolutely amazing. It's uh, like a hippie Chuck Berry or something, isn't it, in a way? He had all the tools to do that, what, 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 like to make the Children of Ron this, this rock symphony that if that was staged, that, mm. that would have been magic, absolutely mm. magic. Mm. But he was terrified to be out of the limelight even for like two months. Mm. There's a question here that I like. Are there any tapes left from Lexham Gardens, my people? I remember you playing me yeah. a tape of that when you came to my flat in Ealing in the first interview in 1991, yeah. and it was remarkable. And some of them we put out, but there was... Yeah, there were a couple of... Uh, there's still some more, aren't there? Yeah, I have, uh, I, I have that tape still. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I mean, we should release it, really. It's the great, lo it's the great Lost uh, Bolan album. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's Mark and Steve Peregrine took sitting in, in my front room on the floor. We had two little mics. I had a stereo one of the early domestic stereo tape recorders, and we recorded their set two times, like did two takes. Mm. And uh, on a few of the songs, I'm jamming on bass with them. So mm. there was a possibility, you know, that I would have been played bass. That, that, that happened in later records, on, on his later albums. Mm. And the, these sound pretty clear. And, uh, they sounded great when I heard them. Yeah, yeah. and they're, they're transferred digitally now, so they, they mm. didn't, the, the tapes aren't corroded. I mean, they, the tapes might be corroded by now, but... Uh, yeah, I think it's a bit of a holy grail, that. Yeah, that's the only thing I have left that you oh. haven't heard. 